Hi hey everyone. In this video, we're going to start chapter 11, where we're really going to take a really deep uh, look into aggregate demand. We're going to spend the next two chapters building on aggregate demand, explaining why it is the way it is, why it changes, and what variables influence aggregate demand. And so just for some context, in chapter 10, we developed both aggregate supply and aggregate demand, where we distinguish pretty significantly between the long run and the short run. And so for chapters three through seven, we primarily focused on the long run where prices were perfectly flexible. And because of that, output was really only determined by the supply side. It was really only determined by those factors of production, capital and labor, and technology. And that's why we had that vertical long run aggregate supply curve. Now this assumed that unemployment was always gonna be at its natural rate. But we also saw that in the short run, prices were pretty much fixed, that businesses couldn't respond to changes in demand with prices, so they had to respond to changes in output. And so really, changes in output in the short run were only determined by aggregate demand. They were either determined by movements in aggregate demand or the slope of aggregate, aggregate demand. And because changes in aggregate supply and aggregate demand move output in the short run, that means unemployment was negatively related to output. So if output went down, unemployment was naturally going to increase. And so clearly, if aggregate demand is this important in the short run, we need a pretty deep explanation for why aggregate demand is the way it is and what makes it move. And so in this model, we're going to develop uh, what's called the ISLM model. ISLM stands for investment savings and liquidity of money model. And that's basically the backbone of the aggregate demand curve. And everything we do in this model, we're gonna assume that we're only focusing on the short run. We're going to assume that all prices are fixed and we're only gonna have that short run aggregate supply curve. And so the ISLM model starts with this thing called the Keynesian cross. So before this model was developed, economists only really had the classical model that we talked about up to this point. They only really had that long run view of the economy. And this was fine for a really long time, but when the Great Depression started, they didn't really have a good explanation for why unemployment was 20% or why output was shrinking so quickly. According to that theory, unemployment would have been 20% simply because that was the natural rate. And so this guy, this British economist, John Maynard Keynes knew that that couldn't be right. And so he started to develop this theory for why we could have fluctuations in the short run. And the ISLM model is the primary result of that theory. He really talked it up for a long time, saying that he knew he was really onto something big. And really, the ISLM model changed the way we do macroeconomics. And so we're going to focus on basically three different things. We're going to keep that same C plus I plus G focus here. But I is now, at least in the short term, going to be planned investment exactly how much a business thought they were gonna spend on developing the capital stock over time. And because we have planned investment, we're now gonna have planned expenditure, how much everybody thought they were gonna spend via consumption, investment, or government spending. And we're gonna distinguish that between actual expenditure or why, which is just realized GDP that we actually see in the world. And so the difference between these two, the difference between actual investment and planned investment, we're going to call it unplanned inventory investment. And so we said right at the start of chapter three that everything a business didn't sell to its customers, it basically sold to itself, that it kept everything it didn't sell as inventory. That's what we're talking about here. Everything they don't sell is going to be unplanned inventory investment. And so the elements of the Keynesian cross are exactly the same things that we had in chapter three. We're going to have a consumption function. And the consumption function is only going to be determined by disposable income, that Y minus T. We're also going to have completely exogenous government policy variables. Again, we're not going to try to determine why the government spends the way it does or why it taxes the way it does. We're just going to let those be exogenous and focus on other elements of the model. So that leaves us with investment. We're going to assume that planned investment, at least for now, is exogenous, that a business chooses to invest yesterday based on what they think today is gonna to be. But that really doesn't matter when we get to today. 
And so clan investment is going to be exogenous. It's going to be determined before we even start whatever period we're in. <clears throat> and so planned expenditure is just going to be the sum of those three. It's going to be consumption plus planned investment plus government spending. And so our equilibrium condition in this model is actually going to say that actual expenditure is equal to planned expenditure. And so earlier in the, in the class when we said that income was always equal to spending, that's basically our equilibrium condition in this model, that Y is going to be equal to C plus I plus G. And that's a really important takeaway. And so instead of graphing all these different models where we have a consumption graph and a government spending graph and an investment graph, we're gonna to try to combine that all into one, into one graph. And so graphically, the Keynesian cross is gonna look something like this. So if we're gonna start with planned expenditure, We're going to put expenditure on the y-axis and output on the x-axis. And so planned expenditure is going to look a lot like that initial consumption function that we had in chapter three. We're going to have some autonomous level of spending and it's going to be upward sloping. So this entire curve is a planned expenditure curve. Where PE is equal to C of Y minus T bar plus I bar plus G bar. Now importantly, Y is no longer predetermined. Y can fluctuate, it's gonna be endogenous to this model. And the slope of this line is gonna be that marginal propensity to consume. And so if we were to raise income or output by a dollar, the amount that total expenditure increases is our marginal propensity to consume, our MPC. And then the last feature of this curve is we're still gonna have this level of autonomous spending right here we're still gonna say that you have to spend some amount of money on necessities, on food and shelter and things like that. And so some amount of consumption is always going to exist. And so this difference between output when it's at zero and expenditure when it's non-zero, that's autonomous consumption. Okay, so we've got that down. But now we have to graph, in addition to all that, we have to graph our equilibrium condition. And so I'm gonna clear this off so we can graph our equilibrium condition. And our equilibrium condition in this model is just gonna be a 45 degree line. Because we said our equilibrium condition was basically planned expenditure was equal to actual spending, that's going to happen when y is equal to PE. And so if you think of like a function where everything on the every x value is also equal to your y value, y is equal to x. The slope of that line is going to be 45 degrees. That's exactly true here. So this entire line is our equilibrium condition. At every point on this line, our total income, our total output is equal to our total expenditure, or our planned expenditure. And so we can take this and we can combine the two and find our equilibrium condition where our planned expenditure is equal to our actual expenditure. Basically, we can just put on that planned expenditure curve to the same graph. 
And so if this is actual funding, where y is equal to PE, that same, that same curve that we had earlier is our planned expenditure curve. Where y is equal to c plus i plus g. Okay? And the point at which these two curves intersect is our equilibrium, right? It's going to say that our equilibrium income is equal to our equilibrium spending. And that entire thing, when taken as a whole, is our Keynesian cross. <clears throat> it shows how our planned expenditure and our actual expenditure interact, and they come together in equilibrium. <clears throat>